Well, welcome, Max, on a rainy day. Rainy, rainy. Rainy Sunday, broad stairs. Yeah. Typical English summer. Shun, shine, and showers. Yes. Well, on the way here, we've got some messages about blood group B and okay. the PGLFs. Okay. From a researcher that's been with the BASIS project for a very long time, is doing a heck of a lot of work, specifically involving the Nazi uh, bases, right. the concentration camps that Barry King was uh, is referred to in Germany, and the and the use of con concentration camp victims in precise blood groups, and you concurred uh, that. Uh, she was just messaged me saying that the Germans are very interested in blood group B mm -hmm. and they use this in a programmable generator life form so they could then take grey souls. Right, and, and, and you superimpose that into the, the body. Okay, I, 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 don't, I think that the Germans are not only interested in blood group B, I think they're also extremely interested in um, uh, any of the rhesus negative blood, particularly O negative and actually AB negative. AB negative is the rarest of all of the rhesus negative blood groups. But going back to B, um, B positive or B negative uh, blood group works like a hive blood group, works like a hive mind blood group. Um, not to say that anybody who has uh, B blood it is not an individual themselves, it's just on a collective level. They are working for a single agenda without knowing it. So um, if you, c if you could um, amass um, a huge amount of people with blood group B, then you could have a sort of an army working for you and um, each individual would be, would be unknown that they are actually part of, of the collective. Well, that would be some kind of a um, gang-stalking situation there. Um, Where you could get an awful lot of people who would respond to that. Well, yeah, because there's a lot of people who have um, blood group B. Now, it's interesting from my point of view, and also some more work that's been, um, data that's been published, um, is on... Andrew Power has written a very important book about Ireland, mm. Land of the Pharaohs. Yes. And uh, Ben, the hospital porter, has uh, done a bit of an analysis on that and had a chat with Andrew Power. Mm. He's, he's um, Andrew Power is somebody who's did some research about um, the, the matrix control of, of Ireland and how the Battle of the Boyne was actually a ritual and not a battle. Mm -hmm. But the important thing about this is another person has found out that Northern Ireland is very highly rhesus negative. Mm, okay. So from the point of view of programming people. Yes, it's a lot easier to do. And that's why you have, you know, Northern, Northern Ireland is a, is, a, is a extraordinarily locked down facility, yeah. you know, and um, the, okay, the, 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 the upside to having um, O negative blood or rhesus negative blood is that um, it has and, and absorbed, um, absorbs a much higher amount of oxygen into it. So it, the body allows far, far more oxygen into the blood. So, for example, if you were a runner, or if you were a fighter, or if you were, did anything physical, your endurance um, would be longer and you would be more explosive. The downside to having rhesus negative blood is that um, they run out of steam very quickly. They have to stop and they have to regroup and then go again. The, the O positive blood has a much longer endurance, it's just it's not explosive. So if you, have, if you had an army of uh, rhesus negative uh, team, a team, an army of rhesus negative, then they would be excellent in a very short term. They could destroy uh, something that necessary very, very quickly. It's just um, that only lasts for a very short period of time. They're very explosive, but then they burn out quickly. So you'd use them hit hard? Hit hard and then pull out and then use your endurance. Yes. But they do hit harder than any other of the bloodstreams, and they do. And then there, there's the nature of the blue blood because the oxygen into the blood, then uh, it's a higher copper content. Thus, um, when it, when oxygen hits the blood, it turns a, t a slightly bluish color. So, uh, is that related to the greys or reptilians or the two families? Um, mo most most of the um, most all of the reptilian beings. The Alpha Draconis, and well, I mean, if there's there's six or seven types of 
uh, reptilians that are on this planet. Some snakes, some velociraptor looking, some actually look like dinosaurs, but generally they have, the shape-shifting ones have, all have uh, rhesus negative blood. You don't, okay. Okay, so with, with the super soldier topic, um, the benefits of having the rhesus negative are that they are, it, it is easier for the queen, quote unquote, queen bee to take control of all the rhesus negative because they are working like that. But they do have um, O positives working also with them. It's just the O positive um, are a lot more difficult to control, but through trauma, I mean, it's like we were talking about earlier, a lot of the children die when they go through this process, but the ones who do survive, the, the O positives that do survive are extremely, um, beneficial to that because the um, endurance is goes on and on and on and on and on. So what about the current situation? The last interview you mentioned a lot of the children that died in your program. Yeah. Could you really describe what your program involved? And of course this connects us with James who's now been arrested. Okay, okay. Um, okay, so, so I have um, flash sort of memories and they, they, they start from really when I was at the first school that I went to, which was uh, in Sussex, and um, I started to have memories then, and then um, after that they were sporadic. So then after that, I sort of remember um, being, so first of all, maybe five, six, seven years old, then nothing, and then more like 11, 12, 13 years old, and then when I, uh, th then I, I sort of blocked it out. Then uh, as I reached my mid to late 20s, um, I wasn't able to block it out anymore. I think that I um, began to use drugs or alcohol because I didn't want to face what was going on. When and did you start this? When did this happen? With, in terms of, in terms of uh, um, self-abuse in that way? Well, it started when when I was very, very, very young, when I was two, three, four, five, I have met multiple memories of things coming into my room and uh, some, it, it, always, it always happened in the room and they were some, some nasty things. Uh, no, what do you mean by nasty so, things? So, so, sort of sex, sexual, intrusive sexual things. Um, uh, a lot, I, I, remember, I remember seeing a lot of witches, sort of minds, like stereotypical looking sort of witches. I would be taken out of my bed, I'd sort of float up above my bed, float, float, float up through the roof of the, the house, up further and further, and then I'd go through a set of black clouds, I'd go above the black clouds, and then I'd sort of see even more, almost like a stereotypical looking uh, Macbeth the witches of Macbeth were around a cauldron and they'd be cackling. And then when I'd see that, I'd go into shock and I'd freeze and then I'd kind of black out and feel myself land back in the bed again. So because this went on continuously when I was very young and I used to call for my parents and then after a while they stopped coming. So I had to start dealing with it myself. Now, uh, when I was 15, 16, 17, <clears throat> um, or I'd sort of forgotten that that had happened. When I was 15, 16, 17, uh, something happened and um, I s something triggered me and I think it was probably a, f a very close friend of mine said something and I heard a click in my head and I remembered all the things that had happened again. What happened? Um, all the things I just talked about, okay. which were the um, unpleasant things as a kid. I, they all came back at once. I mean, do you think, when did that happen? I mean, do you think you were being deprogrammed or something? I think something was happening where, um, I mean, the, the main desperate, the main thing that they didn't want to me is to ever, ever remember anything like this. They want me to remember, they want me to think that I've had a straight, uh, normal sort of life with its ups and downs that everybody has, but um, this is my reality is this and that's what it was. And when I started to remember when this happened when I was 17, I freaked out, I panicked. And when I panicked, I had all these flashes back that when the sun started to come down, I started to get this terrible, terrible feel like something bad was going to happen. So what sun? What was the sun? I don't know what it was really, but I was fine. I, I would usually, this is in England, I, was, I would usually be fine up until about six or seven o'clock. And then when the sun started going down and started getting dark, all these feelings started to invoke inside of me like whatever happened when I was a kid was about to happen again. So I started to self-medicate and I found, I used to drink wine with my... Uh, what do you mean by self-medicating? So I used to drink wine with my mum 
um, when I was 17, 18. And I found, when this started to happen, I found I w I'd, I'd have a glass of wine or I'd have a beer or whatever, and slightly th these feelings and these memories would subside. So I'd, I'd sort of worked out, well, shit, you know, if I don't want to, I don't want to feel these things anymore. So uh, I found something that will repress them. So that, um, so that was around 17, 18. And when I learned uh, the medication, to sell, how to self-medicate, it sort of uh, perpetuated itself from there. So then I learned, okay, well, I don't want to feel that way. I'm going to do whatever I can to not feel that way. So what happens is when you keep repressing and keep repressing and keep repressing, um, it sort of becomes like a boiling point. You can only repress to, repress to, a, to, uh, uh, to a certain extent before everything comes out in one go. Um, there had been a number of times through my 20s when I had realized that using, uh, that, that addiction had become part of me, not for fun, but it had become part of a way of life for me because I didn't want to address any of those things. And it does work very well because if you use that, you are then, you can basically believe or convince yourself that none of this stuff ever happened. Um, leading on from there, as I turned towards 30 years old, um, uh, I had a complete uh, snap. In the uh, Monarch program, yes, it, it's, it seems that once you hit about 30, the Monarch program starts the, to decline. Well, it seems to me that the, um, the altars and the programming start to bleed through and break down around that age. So, if, and, and I was part of... Um, Alpha programming, beta programming. Alpha being, um, there's delta programming as well. So I, I was actually thrown in, into uh, all of those things. But they started to bleed through. I turned 30, uh, 30, just past 30, 31. And there was nothing I could do about it. Delta, de delta. Th those categories of programs just yeah, briefly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Delta programming generally is, is a form of assassination or a form of... Uh, getting information through um, physical means. Um, yes. So this is it's, it's sort of uh, your basic um, uh, military attack programming. That's what that is. Um, that's Delta. Be beta programming is uh, used 80%, usually 80%, which is the monarch, 80% of women, and there are 20% of men which are used, which is also um, sexual programming. So giving and receiving information through a me sexual means. So um, a spy would be able to go meet up with somebody, have sex with them, and then download the information that was necessary from the person to collect it into their cells, then go back to whoever you are working for, have sex with this person, and then download the information to this person. So it is all done through um, that means. Now, how do they do the download? How do they do it? How, when you say download, you sort of look at somebody's as soon as, eyes. As, as, okay, so as soon as this, uh, the sexual act is um, done, then the, the two energy fields of the, per of the people merge. And um, if you are shown or trained in a specific way, pr most often unconsciously, then this information is then downloaded to the energy field of that person. And then you can be hooked up to a machine or you can have sex with somebody else and then that person gets the information. It's being done a lot by the Russians. They're sending out uh, 13, 14, 15 year old girls out into certain areas in the US and the UK and sex acts will be done by with high businessmen and that inf the information then will be taken and given back to where the KGB, if that exists, it, you know yeah. what I mean? So it's been still in use. It's very effective. It's, 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 it's very effective because nobody thinks that that is the way that it's done. And then the, the whole point is that the actual person themselves doesn't know, doesn't know they've, they've, they've got the information. Yeah, absolutely. Most often. Right. And then the other thing is that if you get rid of that person, your resources, you haven't really expended too much resources. No, because there's plenty of other ones who can do the job again. Now, is this where these children are collected? I mean, for, for okay, so going back to that, so when I was talking about the children who were involved, so, so the... the, the um, 
I'm going to mention Montauk, um, and um, which is ju you know just off of New York. I'm not exactly sure that it w I was in Montauk, but w um, the descript th when I look at it, it is very familiar to me. But wherever I was, it was an identical layout and setup to the Montauk experiment. And then there are a number of, them of, of other ones just exactly like that. Now, this is very important because Lisa is doing an awful lot of work on this, and she's collaborating with Peter Moon, who's written a lot of the Montauk Love Peter books. Peter Moon, yes. You know, there's a whack of stuff going on there, connecting with this concentration camps. Yeah. But there's there's smoke signals which indicate that Rudlow Manor yes. uh, and Warminster, very close to Devizes <coughs> in Wiltshire, uh, may have had some kind of involvement with this stuff, but that's only just little whiffs of smoke. The thing is that a previous soldier who's spoken is saying that, there's some, that he, the stuff that he was exposed to was in the artillery uh, is just horrendous stuff. Yeah, in terms of that, what, what I have seen is I've seen those um, spiders that are about, it's, I have to be, it's, when I see them, I'm in an in-between state. It's not like I can look up and see them now, and it, it, it's just before I fall asleep, or if I'm in a tw like an in-between state, that's when I see them. And they're about this big, and they, they seem more mechanical than actual beings, and I've seen them many times, and sometimes maybe three, four, five, six of them crawling across the ceiling. Not only that, when I was uh, living in an apartment in Los Angeles, I went, I fell asleep uh, one time, and I knew I was under attack at that moment, and I heard these things rushing and across the ground, and they they were squeaking and they were sort of scuttling around. And th when I looked at them, I could, when I looked, I could see that they look they sort of looked. I know it's going to sound strange, like gremlins. They looked like actual from the movie Gremlins, and they sort of seemed to be mischievous things to. Uh, to cause sort of more chaos and they always seem to be around when there was shadow these shadow beings around too so whatever these little scu scuttle things are, are are controlled and well, a lot of people and i seeing these things the, the ones that run along the yeah, ground scuttlers i saw them first in a transmitter carrie cassidy says she's seen them uh, lisa's seen them um, some of the crop circle people have seen them, uh, big things, very large ones. Yeah, these, one, these ones I see are about this big and they look like gremlins. They have ears like that, they have teeth, they yeah, they make noise and they laugh. Uh, they're just like mischievous, like running around things. And they're, they, they, they're not, not, not nice. No, they? they're not nice, but they're not evil, but they're mischievous and they're, they're working for something. They sort of hide things and they, sort of, uh, they, they bring around sort of negative energy too. That ties in with something that, uh, I, if I can just say this, this ties in with something very bizarre that happened. I was living in an apartment 222, which ties in with these things, this was in Los Angeles, and um, one morning I got a letter in the mail, and the letter was um, addressed to me, and it was from something called the Neptune Society. And I'd never, well, I'd driven part, if, when driving down Ventura Boulevard in Los Angeles, there's this huge building. Uh, you can't really see, there's windows, but you can't really see anything about it. And on the top it says Neptune Society. That's all, there's nothing else. So I was, I'd seen it since I was a kid. I'd never knew anything about it. I received a letter in the mail, and it said the Neptune Society. I opened the letter, and the, all the letter was saying, it says, Dear uh, Mr. Spears, have you ever considered, um, uh, being cremated when you die. Cremation, and it gives me all these reasons why cremation is a far better uh, way to go than being buried. And it was about this long, and it was uh, signed at the bottom. If you have any more queries or anything else, please don't hesitate to contact us. So I left it on the side of the breakfast area where I, went, where I was, and then I went to sleep that night. Well, at three o'clock in the morning, I woke up, and um, I heard this crackling sound, and I sat up, and the whole of my kitchen was on fire. All the front of the uh, breakfast area was on fire. The food was on fire. The flames were like coming off like this. Now, was this a lit actual or vir virtual? It was actual flames. All, right. All the top of the thing was burned. And the letter that was on there had b completely burned out. I ran up, I jumped, I put the fire out. Um, and also all the gas was turned on. All the, all the gas oh. from the oven was turned on. Ah. Now, uh, well, that would be one way of cremating you. Uh, yes, I thought that was extremely... Probably doesn't do a very good job, though. Um, and um, I had uh, feelings it was connected to the Hellfire Club. And because well, I... mentioned the Hell Hellfire Club is interesting because I think it involves 
Jimmy Savile and also yes. the methodology of Marie Kayali's daughter's really incineration attempted incineration in hospital they right? like that there's something yeah. because there's something about the element of fire which allows these beings to come the through ring of fire yes well there you go back to the Johnny Cash song that's I, I the ring of fire Johnny he's talking all about that that's what he's talking about it's a hellfire ritual but when I left when I got up that morning to leave the house there was a black suburban tinted windows sub, um, suburban sitting outside the front of my building and on the license plate it said blow you up and as I woke up... So they up, were basic... Oh, th that was in the dream. This is real. Oh, this is real. The flames were real. Waking up was real. The truck was... The car was real. So they're basically letting you know. That was 2011 that happened. Um, uh, and you know what day it happened? It happened on August the 12th. And August the 12th is a very specific day because it is connected when, when Sirius is at its highest point in the sky. August 11th, 12th and 13th are called the dog days because the dog star is the most visible. Now Crowley got married on August the 12th because um, he sees it as um, when Sirius has its highest effect on this planet and he was trying to do, uh, he was trying to bring in an that open... That wouldn't happen every August the 12th, would it? What's that? It wouldn't happen every year, would it? What doesn't happen every year? That Sirius would have its most... Yes, every single year. Okay. And um, at that point, so there are negative and pos positive factions coming from Sirius. He was trying to open doorways to bring the uh, uh, certain ones from Sirius through here. Um, when, you, when I started to get close um, to what was going on with that and what was going on with the dog days, um, they wanted me out. And um, I, 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 I was okay. It was fine. There was a couple of other things over the next, on the 13th of August and the 14th of August, um, there was a couple more attacks that I had. Out of nowhere, um, my whole apartment became infested with cockroaches within a 24-hour period. Cockroaches coming out of everywhere. So uh, now, is that is that an actual placement of 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 them, or is it somebody did materialize them in? Or? I think that um, uh, I was being. Uh, it was the heaviest attack that I've ever had. I mean, this uh, is the kind of thing you only sort of see in horror movies. Yes, and it was absolutely real. Um, on top of that... So how uh, did you get rid of them? What happened? Um, I, I went and told the landlady, I said, this is going on, and um, I had to stay out of the apartment for a week, and she sprayed everything and um, got rid of the majority of them. They didn't come back. And has this happened to other people? I mean, was it just a dirty apartment? Or, no, no. I this mean, was, this was a block, I mean, was this something? No, no, no. It was a, it was a, very, it was a very nice apartment. Yeah. And it was... But then the, the, the number of the apartment was 222, which is... A resonance of it's a resonance of me because that's my birthday, two two two. But um, and the important thing about resonances is that's a mechanism of getting things through. It, it, yes, two 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 is also a doorway right next to the front door of the apartment. There was um, there was uh, a hall uh, like a an archway like this, and uh, three o'clock in the morning again. The next on the thirteenth, I think um, I. I, what I thought I got out of bed, I w went to go over, I heard a noise, and um, something came out of the wall. Um, what it was, the, what, uh, I think I was dreaming, but I was half dreaming, half awake. It looked like, a pr it looked like the stereotypical, uh, what predator looks like. I don't know what they are, I'd never seen one before, but when it came up to me, came close to me like this, it st was still for a second, and then um, it screamed, screamed in my face to invoke as much fear as possible. I had learned at that point I was very uh, had a deep understanding of solfeggio and sound harmonics and I knew the harmonics to do with my voice to try and help it to try and uh, get rid of it I did the sound which is the hue HU it's a certain frequency sound and when I did it um, it sort of blended got back into there this so period of time this, this is important I mean it wouldn't necessarily be that sound from anybody else's voice for your voice, yeah, the, it works. Hue, yes, yeah, the hue, the hue sound. Yes, yeah. you can but, find that on YouTube. It's yeah, but for other people, it wouldn't necessarily work. It, it, if you because hit the, of the basically the resonance of the voice, uh, yeah, is the important thing. Yes, there are certain sounds. There is a certain sound that they cannot um, stand. That they that they panic and they they run away from. And um, well, like in this in this spoof science fiction comedy film, you know, Alien Invasions or from Mars or whatever it is. Oh, Mars Attacks. Ma Mars Attacks. Yeah. You know, well, there's used, a lot of truth in that movie. They used um, you know, yodeling country music as a means. That's of, funny. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah, so that that was um, I, I stayed in that apartment. Just while we're on the movie, uh, anything in that's just true that. In, uh, well, I don't know the movie as well. I know they live, and in and the movie they live, and in they live, there is a sound, there is a frequency. I don't know if you remember it towards the end, that Roddy Piper goes to, and it's a frequency that's being beamed out, which uh, enables these. Um, uh, aliens to look in human form yes. and when he breaks this frequency then they're all seen yeah yeah I, i've noticed since we've changed to digital now um uh, my my senses have become extremely heightened and i even when i'm just listening to the tv or even when you turn the volume down i hear this uh, sound frequency coming from the television that completely um, messes with my pineal gland now this is important because another member of the base's back room so to speak Right. The thing is that he had devised a device to encrypt records on CDs mm -hmm. so that it wouldn't be able to be uh, copied. Right. But it was a type of acoustic thing as opposed to some kind of digital tr trademark encryption. Right. right. And when he played this um, in the record executive of the board, n a number of the board just freaked out because they were reptilian. So he completely acts, freaked out, I'm yeah, sure, yeah. yeah. So there's a particular sound... That they that cannot them, stand, yes. yeah, because it, it, it alters the, the holographic projection that they, they're keeping. And I think um, I'm, uh, it's a misconception that, that, that they are actually shape-shifting. Some are, but it's a misconception. Yeah. What they're actually doing is altering your visual cortex to yes. make you think yes. you're seeing them that yes, way. Yes, absolutely, yes. And this is very important as well. You know, because you can that that that's the truth. They're not actually looking that way. They've just um, uh, manipulated your mind to think that they are. And that must work through all kind of visual media. Otherwise, you'd see a lot of these aliens walking around on the TV. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've noticed a lot of news readers because they're doing that as an indoctrination and conditioning. If you look at news readers, because they're the ones who are in your in your house every you know every day. Look carefully at the news readers. It's slowly uh, drip drip, uh, conditioning you to yeah. accept. BBC is the worst, I think. Yes. I mean, ITV. I can't watch it. I heard that. I heard somewhere that the the, the 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 true acronym of BBC, and it's it's not British Broadcasting Company, and I can't remember it now. But you might want to look into that. Yeah. Also, it also Probably it comes up to seven. Nice. B two, B two, and C three. Seven. Seven is the number of the serpent. Right. And it's interesting that in the early days of broadcasting, it was a British Broadcasting Company. Ah, okay. Not corporations. Not so corporations, so now it's... Okay, yeah. okay. So a lot of things. There's some radio amateurs who are trigged about broadcasting. Something happened. Yes. The beginning to see, look, when broadcasting started, and we adopted the types of broadcasting we use. Sure. They've noticed that something started to happen in society. Yes. And this, of course, links with my stuff with Caroline and all that sort of stuff. Can I just go... Waffling about MK Ultra switching off at 30. Yeah. Um, okay, so I can tell you what happened then. Uh, so in March of 2008, I was living in a, um, a shared house in, um, in uh, the north, the north part of the San Fernando Valley, which is in Los Angeles. And um, I started. I mean, I, I, I've, I've never. I never had voices in my head. I never had that. I never had that before. I just sort of had um, an understanding. But that night um, in March of 2008, right around just after when Heath Ledger died, um, and he? Heath Ledger, the, he played the Joker in Batman. Oh. He died on January the 22nd, which is interesting because the number 22 is in sync with the Joker card uh, and, and the Fool card in the Tarot card deck. And so there was, you know, there's all the... Uh, and being a Joker and all that. A absolutely, yes. So you're suggesting that basically the Batman movies has got some kind of ritual magic involved? Absolutely, yes. Yeah, absolutely. And um, so Why was he murdered? What did he... Uh, he, he, he was murdered... He, okay, well, his real, his real father... Uh, wasn't the father that um, we that, that is shown to the public? His real father was a very famous actor, and I've forgotten his name now. Um, he he uh, he did a lot of theatre in the in the fifties and sixties. I forget his name. When it when it come when I remember it, I'll I'll let you know. 
Why is it necessary to have a different father than your real one? Well, they often will take... In the public domain. They'll often take, because they don't want any association, and they they like to um, try experiments, and and a lot of it is lab rat stuff to test out, but... But I mean, it's also, you get get lumbered with being so-and-so's father, and nobody watches you because of that. Right, right. Oh, Uh, I think some, you just, just make sure your plug's in. Um, anyways, so, yeah. so in well, March, March of 2008, um, some strange things started happening, happening to me. Um, I had some extremely vivid dreams, and then I got uh, taken out of my body and shown that uh, my life as I thought it was, was not. The, 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 uh, the memories that I had, my childhood memories, were not what I th- quite thought they were. And um, for about a two weeks period of time, I was shown memory after memory after memory of um, what was really going on. And I remember being shown taken to um, underground facilities uh, at different points, some of them in uh, Sussex, some of them in Kent, and um, some of them with people who I knew from school, but um, would have no clue that they were involved at all, at all. And um, I would sort of come to on a, on a, mini, on a, on a mini bus or a bus where there were three of us on one side, three of us on the other side, and sort of in a dazed state. And then we'd go to go somewhere and then black out again. And uh, this sort of led for me to, I was seeing it from um, in the corner of the room, but we would give, being given tests and they would give it something Who was like, giving you? Who was, was giving, this? okay, so there was a woman at the front. They, How they, was she dressed? I mean, was she, she was dressed, um, not, not uniform, but very well dressed. You know, dressed up as if uh, she was a, um, a banker or a businesswoman. Well, that was implied that it's in some very salubrious in- environment where yeah. she has to be dressed. Yes, and there was also... Another was a place that's in public domain. Yes, but it was underground. So it was below. Not, I'm not talking seriously underground, but it was below How, where... I mean, you were taken down to the lifts. How do you know you were underground? Well, I was driven down. There was, okay. a, there was, a, there was a slope that we were driven down under, and then, then it was down Who's there. We? Uh, me and these three other, uh, six, five other kids that were there, some boys, some girls. And I, and, uh, but when we were there, we were sort of in a dazed state, so we weren't communicating with each other. Can we you just... remember any way and how you were collected? Really, I only remember all of a sudden being in, in the van. I don't remember being taken, I just remember all of a sudden being in the van and being uh, sitting in, in sort of like rows of desks and then uh, uh, it was very cold and there, was no, it wasn't war- there was no warmth coming from the people that were there. There was a male who was standing by the door, a female at the front dressed as I was saying and then uh, somebody would bring round sort of, but it wasn't a Rubik's Cube though, but it was like an unfold, it was like a, it, there's, a there's something called Rubik's Magic and it's where you unfold it like this and then you have to put it in again and fold it to try and make and they were doing tests to see how fast certain ones were able to do it. That explains, uh, uh, it's one way of testing a form of of visual conceptual thinking. Cognitive, yes, yeah, yeah, yes. And I felt like, but um, when they put it down initially I was like, what, what, you know, what, what, what am I supposed to do? I have no clue what I'm supposed to do. And then they said, just do it. And then I started touching it. And as soon as I started touching it, I, I immediately knew how to do it. And I did it very fast. So some of the other, ki- some of the other kids and the kids were at the time when this was going on were about five, six, seven years old. So I was looking back at a previous memory rather than something that was happening now. Um, that is, this, was, is this painful to remember? It's, it's because it's so, um, it, because it doesn't fit into the, the timeline of what I thought my life was, it's sort of very confusing. It doesn't make sense. Who allowed that to happen? Why, why, why was that okay? Where were my parents at the time? Um, I remember, and this is sort of ties in as well, when I was living in Lewis, which is um, in, in Sussex as well, I was very close friends with uh, a, a little girl. Her name was Meredith Kennedy. And um, I was very close with her. her. Both of her parents were scientists. And often they used to take her and I to um, Sussex University Lab. 
there was a lab there and I remember I remember getting in the car and being driven there but then when we'd get driven there uh, the, the mother or the father would leave and then we'd be left in the car and then, then some strange things would happen in the car I kept thinking the car was rolling rolling and then sort of went dizzy came to came back again but I have flashes of memories going into inside of the lab now recently I've looked into it more and Sussex University is an arm there is an arm of Tavistock that works right out of Sussex University and my uh, very close friend at the time Meredith Kennedy her mother also worked for the Stan for Stanford Stanford Research Institute so you, she used to go back and forth from Stanford to uh, Sussex University and Stanford then con was actually continuing um, the work that Tavistock had done um, uh, you know, which was which be, was began by Freud and, and some other ones there, so that they could completely understand how to split the mind, and um, basically program one personality into the left brain and one personality into the right brain, where each one. I mean, it's sort of similar to um, trauma-based mind control, where you create alters, but this was very specific. So they would play. So they could do that without the trauma. This, w th this particular one was being done without trauma. I mean, there was enough trauma that I was left there without knowing. So it's not working. The trauma thing is, dis has, is a crude way of doing it. The trauma, tra they're, they're not really interested in, in they're, tr they're interested in trying out all different types of methods. This particular one, which was done by a doctor called Robert Speary, S-P-E-R-R-Y. And Dr. Wright, and he was um, one of the Nazi scientists. And what he wanted to try and do was to see if he could play sounds, words, uh, stories, music to one side of the brain and then play completely separate one to the other side of the brain. So then it confuses the brain and um, splits it off. So then you can program one and program the other, which then creates um, massive confusion as the child gets older because it's not sure. Uh, whether it's coming or going sort of thing. This also induces addiction because um, then they created pharmaceuticals that were specifically made for people who'd gone through that trauma. A lot of the um, uh, opiates that were created in the United States were there made specifically because they knew that these kids were going to become, were going to search that out and find it and become addicts to it. And this is important because in the Channel 4 program, Confessions of an Alien to Black Tea, they made, a, they made a big issue of Chantel and the Kentucky Fried Chicken. So the placement of Kentucky Fried Chicken with the, with the special mix in that, mm. it's been described by others as an abduction food. Really? Yes. So the use of that could be a double trigger. So KFC in itself is a basic anagram of fuck, right? If you just, if you just oh, switch those around the other way. Well, also, the um, is the, the old grand grandfather image on that a, st a trigger as well? Yes, absolutely, one hundred percent. And the grandfather image on there, when an, if if somebody from Asia looks at this uh, man's face, it looks Asian to them. If a white person looks at it, it looks white to them. Right. If it, so the, the, it's it's very very cleverly done like that. And the man who um, the man who 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 was behind K KFC doesn't quite look like that, but um, he was also a master programmer, handler, slave handler, and he when when the trauma was done by him, you would be shown a face of this KFC, the the actual thing. So you'd be keep flash that face, flash that face. So you'd keep being drawn to. Now it. I have to say that me even mentioning that person's name will trigger her. I'll get a huge amount of abuse immediately okay. for saying that. Okay. Because it triggers, and I think that that means that the relevant people involved in Channel Four were were deliberately triggering. And it should be interesting to note that Marie Marie Kayali, when she was waiting at the station to come down to do the four programs she was doing with me in Wiltshire, met the producer of that program. But anyway, that's a side issue. Really? Okay. Totally random issues. Yes. Im uh, improbable probability. There. Yes. Now, towards the end of this thing that happened to me in March. Um, I was spending time with uh, two, a male and a female who were older than me, 20 years older than me. And I don't want to mention their names because I don't want to um, cause them any trouble, but I do know that they were um, assets and that one of, one of, I can mention the name of one of them, his name was James Chandler and he was maybe in his uh, late, mid to late 50s. He grew up on an Air Force base, um, he grew up from when he was That's two. That's a familiar name. I've heard something like that. 
Somewhere now forward. Chandler, you take the C off, you have Handler. Now, when I was going through this massive trauma in this, 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 this onslaught of memories that came back in March, he would ask, he said to me, look, come round, everything's going to be fine, come round here. And I was having an extreme, I didn't know where I was. I would wake up, get, go to my car in the morning, I'd look on the foot, on the ground of my car, and I would see receipts that said that I'd bought something at three o'clock in the morning, five o'clock in the morning, and uh, I was sound asleep in bed at that time. So, um, no, I found the receipts. So what had been happening was... Was I'd there any dirt in your clothes or anything at all to indicate that you'd been outside physically? I was, woke up with clothes on. So um, uh, I had gone out and I had done something and um, uh, bought something and I had absolutely no clue. So anyway, I went round to these people's houses and uh, I sat down on the ground um, it, in, in the house and this was, uh, these two people were there and they said, Max, why don't you have a lay down? Have a lay down, you know, you don't seem very well, you're bright red, nothing, you know, you seem like you need, so I lay down on the ground, put my head on a cushion. As soon as I put my head on the cushion, I, well, I felt like I sunk into the ground. Uh, I then became paralyzed. I couldn't move my legs or my arms. I couldn't open my eyes, but I could hear everything that was going on. Within about a couple of minutes after that, um, I could hear bells ringing and I could hear these things sort of incense smelling. And I heard a chain like this being, like, like there was something here and it was like incense being spun around like this. I heard ch the changing of clothes and I heard um, ringing, stuff like that. Now I heard them talking about that um, uh, that they had been waiting to place whatever um, this ritual was going on. They had been waiting for it and it had to be done in this house and they were going to try and attempt to place, uh, I don't know what you'd call it, it was some sort of um, entity that had been locked down for a very long period of time what do you mean by an entity See, uh, locked okay. down? Okay. Well, when they started to do the... I, I was stripped naked, and when they started to do this ritual, um, there was some form of sex magic going on in the ritual, and then I felt something. Um, I, he I heard sounds, and I felt something being placed into my body. Now, before we get there, when you say, what, what sort of creature, what a long time, any idea? Well, I saw it in my mind's eye, and what I saw in my mind's eye was an enormous... Um, sort of a, sort of a, a, maybe sort of a, sort of a minotaur looking being with uh, two horns, muscular, red, uh, green, and it had been shackled, had been chained by its ankles, chained here like this, and I could smell, brim I could smell burning uh, rock. I could smell it very, 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 very strongly, but I couldn't move. Okay, then I saw whatever was going on, then was projected and put in, layered slowly over the, with the words that were being said. I heard chanting and words that were being said that was layered into, um, that somehow attached to my chakra energy points because I was at a weak point. Generally, when you're at your weakest point is when they'll go for it and do it. Um, uh, then I blacked out, nothing more. The next thing I know, I'm sitting on a couch. I'm sitting back on a couch and I feel extremely powerful. I feel like I want to jump up and run a marathon. I felt so, so strong. Now the woman came in and she said to me, Max, you haven't been doing too well. Why don't you take a drink of this? I go, what is it? She said, it's electrolytes and it's this and it's that. And it was bubbling and it was in a cup like that. And um, I had a feeling inside of me that said, do not drink this because if you drink it it's going to reinforce whatever has been done and you will be stuck so i was sitting there with it for about five or ten minutes and um she was saying why haven't you drank it why haven't you drank it and, uh, and i sipped it and it tasted unusual she came in again and i spilt it spilt it all everywhere on the ground she <gasps> she panicked like that went left went back and made another one and brought it in and this time I did drink it. And after I drank it, I was sitting there for more. I felt like the feelings I had were ex like I could get up, I could lift up. I had extreme strength, okay? So I was left there. Then the other guy whose name is James. Could you actually lift things up? Yes. Yes, right. I felt That's like my important. strength has increased by five, 10 times. So you essentially seem to have been programmed with the strength of a minotaur. And, and a minotaur I, being half human, half bull? Yes. 
Then they, they brought me some food, okay? They said, look, you've got to eat. As, when I tried to eat a sandwich, they brought me a Subway of all things. When I took a bite of the Subway, the Subway tasted like burning metal. Every time I took a bite out of it, it tasted like burning metal. So I spat it out and put it on the ground. Now I asked myself in my head what's going on, and then something said to me, um, you're tasting that because the thing that has been placed inside of you has been biting on these chains for thousands and thousands of years. And now you have taken on that inside of you, so everything is gonna taste like that. But not to worry, it's only gonna last three days and it'll be gone and you'll feel fine again. So this, uh, that went on, that went on two hours later after that. Something happened and my body went rigid and whatever was inside of me was rejected and left. And then I felt, it just, it walked out, I mean, it, it left me and I how felt... Did, how, how did it do? It just... It sort of like, I felt whatever it was uh, couldn't stick or didn't stick and sort of moved out like that. At that point, this guy James Chandler brought a picture of my, a uh, picture of... Um, somebody who's related to me over and uh, showed me this picture and then they said um, if it doesn't stick in you it will certainly stick in him and um, don't worry about that it's failed for you so then uh, as it's failed then you need to be taken out and so then I got this terrible fear that um, I'm gonna kill you yes and um, so this went on and um, I went back into the other room and crashed out and fell asleep again. When I fell asleep again, I w there was two um, officers, not what seemed like Nazi officers, standing either side of me. And what they uniforms did they have? Uh, they had the old uh, World War II uniforms, what, from what I can understand. The stereotypical Nazi World War II uniforms, and they were standing either side of me. And they had told me that what's going on right now is that there have been hundred year war battles for the last thousand years. And at the turn of every century, these wars are won or lost. And each time, and that, that he said that, we, that this particular faction had been winning for time after time after time after time. They said they set up all of the Formula One wins, all the World Cup wins were all set up to, to, to show um, how much in power they are. Yeah. Okay. And it's they interesting that a lot of horse racing uh, things seem to have uh, magical logos on them. Yes. In, in horse racing. Yeah, and it's but yeah, it's basically a ritual every time. But they showed me the seals over where they'd won. So they were gold seals, um, one on top of the other, on top of the other. And they said that the final battle is now happening now, and that they ha they were already in a position to win, and they were thanking me. And I said, well, look, I don't know. I haven't done anything. I don't know anything about it. And they said, because you don't remember yet. Then um, I crashed out of sleep again. And I haven't ever talked about this, Miles. So I crashed out of sleep again. Then there was a thing. It looked like a gargoyle, but it was as big as this room and had black, black wings, like bat, bat wings. Picked me up like this, pulled me back away from the earth, away from the earth like that. So I saw the earth like this. There were rings around the earth, different colored rings around the earth. And this thing pointed out, each one of these was thought prisons, were a thought prison. And he said, it doesn't matter which one of, one, of, one of the people on this planet get caught up. It doesn't matter which thought prison they get caught up in, whether it's Scientology, whether it's Christianity, whether it's atheism, it doesn't make any difference. As long as you are mag magnetically drawn to one of them, we have you. And he explained how all the thought prisons were layered around the planet and he explained how they were made and um, how were they made they Can were you? made with the will of the creator beings that want to keep this place together so that is the will of the of the archon or what is her name or does it make any difference if there's a name this particular group the I, I, I feel this the, the ones who I was talking to were um, connected to the Alpha Draconis star system. And I do believe that the Aldebaran um, group and that the Alpha Draconis group are at war. And um, I believe that the um, 
It's, it, it's, an, it's been an ongoing war for eons and eons and eons. And the Aldebaran group, which is the bullseye, which in, in the uh, Taurus constellation, where you see the red, left red eye, that's why you have this symbol all the time. It's, it's, a, it's, it's an acknowledgement to the Aldebaran people. It's called the Royal Star. Um, all of the British royal family are directly connected to the Aldebaran group. When you're talking bad or good or evil, or, it's, it's a little difficult at that point because I think it's perspective of the person. You know what is bad or good when it comes to that. They, I think they feel what they're doing is, is good. Well, since they're not actually humans, it, it's from a human perspective. It's, it exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. So they have been using the sun, which is uh, Helios, which is the real name for the sun. The sun, Helios, is the entrance point to get into this 3D realm here. So they're using that as a vortex in out point. Um, and now that's the significance of the 39 steps, but also Saturn. Um, I think you'd mentioned earlier that Saturn was our original sun. Well, Saturn was the original sun, yes. Yeah, 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 and Saturn, yes. And Saturn got pushed out. It was, a, in truth, a more efficient sun and, and a better sun, but then, um, they somehow they caught that sun and imprisoned it the ring around the sun the ring around saturn is an imprisonment it's imprisoned saturn isn't a bad saturn is an you know another word for where they take satan from because it's the controlling force it's capricorn but is this related to the ring makers of saturn of yes Yes, and Lord of the Rings, and the principle is that. So the ring, one ring to rule them all, would be the ring that contains a, that is around Saturn. Which is, of course, was a key thing in 2001. And all. Yes, yes. So there were no planes that hit the building. They were holograms. Just, why did you switch to that? Uh, because I was just thinking about 2001, and they were just testing Project Bluebeam out um, as, as far as they could. What it wasn't Project even a missile. It, yeah. it, it was a well, what was Pro Project Bluebeam? There's an awful lot of stuff about Project Bluebeam. Project Bluebeam originally, um, I think they've been trying to do it for a while, because um, the, you know, the, Michael Talbot wrote that fantastic book, The Holographic Universe, um, and it gives absolute proof that what this particular frequency we're living in is, is, is totally holographic and you can build here through will. If you want to build something, you use your will. If you know what you're doing, you can manifest it that way. That's holographic. Now, um, what they've been doing for a while is going to, you know, Iraq, which is actually um, Sumer. Um, uh, there, there is information and um, uh, ornaments and the spoken word because when when they say the spoken word it just means a certain frequency which is the frequency that holds this this together they were going they were they were attacking to go to the museums to find that out yes absolutely and there are only a few people who know how to go there and translate actually what is going on you know and obviously they, they call it babylon or sumer and they say that's the beginning cradle of civilization it obviously isn't it's the cradle of what we know as no, the known timeline we have now which is the whole point of Andrew Power's book, because the the Irish, the people on these islands yes. were the ones who re-civilized after Great Disaster right. and met those who emerged from Giza. Absolutely, I think it's important to bring up the tribe of, tribe of Dan, yeah. because the, 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 the tribe of Dan is, is the line that comes all the way through, all the way through there, uh, from Atlantis, the, the sources from Atlantis, coming through Sumer, um, Egypt, um, south of France, all the way up, and now they've, Denmark, there's a, there's a huge amount in Denmark, but it's, they're all in Ireland. Danny Boy, oh, Danny Boy, is really about old, old Dan, you know? And in order to hold the Irish down, they've generated this, uh, conflict situation which means they're too busy fighting each other rather than finding out what's going on yes but there was this great awakening in the late 1970s so we'll have to see what happens there yeah 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 I, I, just what's happening and there's always the, 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 this is going in the 36 3600 year cycles and then that's just that's just one and then there's even a, an even bigger cycle than that and right now we're at a window opening point where you can if you know what you're doing get out of this cycle, this soul trapping cycle thing that we've got caught into. Which is what you referred to uh, in the opening remarks of uh, when we met at Canterbury. Mm -hmm. In terms of the key, the key was symbolic, yeah, the key was symbolic. I found out, I, um, you know, since my grandmother died, um, there, you know, there were a lot of secrets in my family and I found out a lot of different things that I, that I really needed. And since our last discussion, we're, we're actually in your grandmother's far from this house. Yeah, yeah, yes, we're here now, yeah, yes. Um, and I, I, I came across a few things that, that really helped me put into perspective what's, 
what's gone on with me and um, the Freemasonic connections and the, the, the Templar connections. And, um, Rosalind Chapel um, and Roswell, actually, who are, it's actually connected. So, but, um, so, so, so there's a Masonic connection with this alleged crash at Roswell? Yes. A ritual. There always is, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, even what what I really was looking at for the longest time is the Priory of Sion, and I think that if you can really break down what's going on with the Priory of Sion, you can you can have a very good idea about. Okay, so the Holy Grail is not a literal literal object. The Spear of Destiny is not a literal object. These are um, symbolic of the, the Spear of Destiny is symbolic of a phallus, and the Holy Grail is symbolic of a um, of a vagina. So, um, uh, what's the point of the symbolism there? Really, why this great symbolism? What's, because, what's, because, because those beings, what's the big deal? those beings communicate in that way. They don't communicate in the linear way. Everything that they do is done through sim. sim their language, their language is symbol. They, they speak through symbols. Even even as hieroglyphs, they're symbols. That's how they communicate. It's a much more efficient um, way of getting across information than using the, uh, the Western alphabet, which is uh, crap. Well, we leave it at that for the, for the second, and we'll get it to the second half. Sounds good. Okay. Yeah. Basis 37, July 13th, take two, take one. Uh, a lot of people that's been interviewed in the past. Mm. Do you want to talk about any of them briefly? Um, you mean the people that you've interviewed before, but in the earlier bases? Yeah. Uh, Sure, I would like to. I'd like to address anything you know that that's that's come up for me. I'm, in other words, I'm going to leave you to mention any names. The, the, if you the, want to do this, it's entirely up to you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That put points me in a in a negative light. Um, okay. So we can go back to, to uh, really the beginning of 2010. Now, I'd I'd uh, I'd spoken to Michael. I'd spoken to James Caswell before then. I'd spoken to him, really. Him and I were corresponding in 2008. When did you first meet? Were you part of the same program? Right. Um, I, I knew, I knew uh, James Caswell from, from when we were very, very young. My first real flash memories of him were around when I was five or six years old in Brighton. And I think I've talked about uh, the thing that happened there. But, um, you know, him and I, I remember him uh, playing video games with him then at a specific uh, swimming pool in, in Brighton Hove, in Hove actually. Um, so yeah, I mean there, there's bits and pieces of memories there, but uh, um, as an adult... Before we get that far, yes. are there any other children involved in this collection of children that yeah. you were part of? Yeah, yes there were. Um, none that I can say, oh, oh, this person, this person, this person, no. There were, majority of them were English, but there were a couple of American girls there too. How many? How many? Two. Two that stand out to me. Two American girls? Yeah. One I know, one nobody else, none of the audience will know. But they're still alive? Yeah, yes. Was you mentioned that a lot of them had died since then? Well, in 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 uh, this is a separate group than, than the Brighton one, but in a separate one, um, I think what happened is when 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 we were being used for, they were testing out how far they could push the trauma. 
because when you when certain sex rituals are done to uh, a child under five years old, when they are, when a child is raped, when a child is raped, and when a, when a male child is raped, what happens is it releases the um, coiled serpent or the kundalini, which is at the base of the spine, and it uh, is opened up before it should be. Everybody has the kundalini rays at some point, and maybe not everybody, but it, right. So, so it means coiled serpent, and it sits at the base of the spine. And when the serpent uncoils, it goes up the spinal column like this, and comes to the brain stem there, and um, you come to a, an enlightened understanding. So you become an enlightened one, or the Illuminati, the illuminated one. When a, when a child, when a male child is uh, raped before the age of five, it goes through something called the vasovagal shock. Now, um, when it's penetrated, the, the uh, coiled snake um, uncoils very, very quickly all the way up the spine to the top of the spine and explodes here in the brainstem, which then shatters the consciousness into many, many pieces like smashing a mirror. Then, um, so all this ritual, kind of, all this kind of abuse that's been happening with many politicians, allegedly, a lot of stuff coming forward now about British political parties, British media, British thing and all that. There's a huge amount of stuff coming out now. Is that all part of that? You cannot be in a high level person in the Illuminati unless you have been illuminated by the key of Solomon. Now they call this rape, they call um, rape like that to a young boy, the key of Solomon. And when that, when that happens, um, you, uh, when it bursts up here, it shatters, then you are able to program these different altars. But not only that, when it shatters there, you, uh, you have a photographic memory. Your, uh, it, it, for some, somehow it raises the IQ. Um, it does a number of different things. Everybody who is in a position of power now has had the key of Solomon used on them. So they have been uh, raped in that way. Which means that... The whole structure of power in Britain, yes, the UK, probably Ireland, because of the recent terrible sure. things about 900 children, 800 children ritually massacred in Ireland. Uh, th th that means the whole power elite has been, yes, yes, and they won't have you in the power elite unless it's been done to you. Just out of just just off sidetrack, Barack Obama, and his middle name is Hussein. Well, um, Saddam Hussein was a major handler and programmer. He was such a high programmer that he would program some of our um, very high power position people through uh, world leaders. And um, uh, Saddam Hussein programmed Barack Obama, Barack Obama um, with that way. That's why he has... Do you know any others he programmed? Um, no, but I know that him and Hillary Clinton uh, worked as a duo to do that. No, I, I, I don't. I just... I mean, Hillary Clinton... Uh, Bill, Bill, Bill Clinton was programmed by, uh, bro, uh, by Saddam Hussein too. All the Rhodes Scholars, all, all of the Rhodes Scholars have to be illuminated, have to have that done to Why them. Why an Arab like Saddam Hussein? Um, well, really he had technology. He had hold of technology. He had hold of Stargate technology. That's one of the reasons why uh, the, he was a very... At one point, he was in, one of the most powerful men on the planet. And uh, the technology that he had um, was um, uh, off the charts. Now, this is very similar to what John Irwin has said in his book, uh, One Step Beyond the Sixteen. Yes, yeah. Amongst other things. Yes, he had that. It's sort of similar to the, there's a movie called Contact, and that spinning thing there, which is able to sh uh, shoot you through to different dimensions. So he had something similar to that. There's a few of them around, but he had control of that. Um, he comes from, he's, he's a direct descendant of Genghis Khan, and that, that bloodline, the Genghis Khan bloodline, who, who um, incidentally had the, the most powerful, um, uh, the most powerful, he, he, he owned the most land of anybody on this planet ever, even more, I mean, so the British Empire was secondary even to Genghis Khan's empire, and whatever... No, it's something that's been maintained on horseback, that seems to be a pretty big deal. Right, right, because in truth they weren't just using horseback. I mean, What they, were they using? They were using interdimensional um, uh, technology. Yeah. 
um, and uh, Genghis Khan um, bred with multiple, multiple, multiple women, so he could continue that bloodline. Which is are, that what Casbolt's doing by doing all this contact with women, by having some kind of psychic link? There's been discussion that um, it's some kind of virus, thought virus, he's instilling in these people. Yeah, yeah. Whatever, whatever's controlling him. Well, he, he um, I think that um, when the wars on Mars went on, there was a 100,000 year war. And um, a lot of us were involved in this 100,000 year war. And while this was going on... Between who? Now, between who? Um, I, okay, well, so, so the basis of it was between the Lyrans or the, the Nordics um, and the uh, Dracos, because the Dracos are chasing the Nordics around to, because they want their DNA, because that allows them to maintain the holographic projection of a human being whilst they're here. Um, so the 100,000, this was a long war. Eventually, at the end of it, what happened was that they had to call a ceasefire because so many were killed on either side. But there was a disease that got out, a virus, that got out during this war and a lot of us um, who were very involved in what was going on, generals, commanders who were up there, contracted this virus. I mean it seems as it was all it must have been created. It was created virus, yeah, and a lot of us contracted this virus and what this virus was. Um, um, some of us took it on board, took it and, and merged it, superimposed it into our own physical body to try and overcome it. And then um, now a lot of us still have it. I have it in me still now. What and does it, it do? What it's is a, it? Well, it's vampirical. It's, uh, it's sort of like a, 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 I mean, it's like a stereotypical vampire. So what does that mean? You shape shift and your teeth go long mm, and you bite people at night? Um, it, it means that... Well, yeah, but only, only somebody who was able to see or, or sensitive to that would be able to see it. It's not as if I would change now and into a monster like that. So if you're sensitive, you can see it. What is the true shape then? Um, of this particular one? Well, uh, from, from this particular um, vampirical virus, they tend to look, th th this, this vampire th sort of thing looks a bit like that old um, stereotypical vision of Nosferatu. Uh, very, very pale skin bald head, sort of dark eyes and sharp teeth, like that. From the original movie? Yes, like that, looks sort of the like original that. original silent movies? Yes. Okay. Yeah, and um, it has the ability, it, it doesn't have a core here, it doesn't have a central core where it maintains itself. It sort of has a, ha an opening here, like a, like a, a void. So it doesn't maintain its own thing, so it, it has to, it doesn't maintain its own energy force. It has to take from others um, to maintain its holographic projection. And a number of us were infected by this particular virus that happened there. Now why is that going to be a, a thing that would cause harm to, to, to people? What's the well, point Well, because it becomes like a parasite. Um, and, and then, you know, you, you, it starts to spread and um, uh, more and more and more. So it's, it's like a parasitic virus that's on the face of this planet. So how does it spread by contact? You know, blood yeah, blood. well, when you start, I mean, when you drain, when you drain somebody else, you sort of, there's never really a drain. When it, when, when it comes to vampires, they don't, they don't just take, there is a uh, exchange. So um, they will take um, energy field or blood from another, but then they will exchange it with their own energy. So that's why a lot of the times uh, victims of uh, a vampire will start falling in love with the vampire, yeah. quote unquote vampire, because they will feel the feelings that the vampire feels. Yeah. And so they will... I mean, I have to say that that seems very similar to two people that, that I know, two women I know. So that they, so it becomes like a, a bond like you can't even ever explain an obsessive bond. And then what, what I think is they're, they're very careful about is it, but if you completely drain them, then their, their personality is wiped and then they become one of them. So then the void is within them and then they have to continue to take from others to maintain. So it's, so it's a virus, I mean, literally like a virus. For me, uh, what I have come to the conclusion now, what happened with me is I uh, absorbed whatever that energy was, or whatever that consciousness was, into myself. And that's why when I was born here, or on paper when I was born here, um, I had that line go down the center of me, which was red 
and yellow. So um, the the uh, the left side of me is um, uh, a higher vibrational Syrian being, a blue Syrian being, and the other side of me is whatever this virus is that I've taken. And it's been a constant internal war to try and uh, uh, which one wants to take over the sides, each side of it. So if the dark, if the Nosferatu type thing takes over, then I become a complete, you know, whatever that does, which is a, continues with does the virus. On, does it happen on full moons and, you, and you've got a... Oh, well, I have extremely weird things happen to me on full moons. Yeah, actually it happened yesterday. I mean, I'm being a bit silly. Just no, no, no. Well, could, well, why wouldn't it? Because when it's a full moon, um, that's when um, the energy, I mean, it's a construct. The moon is a construct in and of itself. It's like the Death Star or is a construct anyway. So but the, I mean, what, you're talking about the moon being a complete artificial construct. Yeah, and it definitely is. It's hollow and it's an artificial construct, yeah. Um, Any uh, other information you know, you know about it? Well, they, they're using, they're using the, the moon as a transfer point um, for to harvest salt, harvest. Yeah. So, so you, you, so it's interesting. John Lear says something like that. When you die, when you're dying here, when you, when you quote unquote die, you are going to a transfer point. And there's actually a machine. There's actually a giant machine up there, which then uh, they do a lot of rituals up there as well, which then Who's wipes. They? Uh, who is it? Uh, well, the majority of the moon is now run by the. Uh, Fourth Reich, but there are. Oh, I mean, so are you saying that 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 spoof movie is actually quite right on? Yeah, yeah. yeah. They always like to tell you the truth with a with a spin of bullshit yeah. in the middle, but um, and then it's sent. You're sent right so back. It's got here. a bit. It's got enough of an atmosphere for people to walk around with very minimal. Yeah, yes, and and then huge uh, underground uh, stations and high technology and. Uh, so what you've got is you've got the Saturn as we have now with the ring around it projecting out um, a false reality pockets, false reality. It's, it, it hits the moon and the moon is working like an amplifier which then creates and projects the false reality onto this planet. Right. So we're living an inverted reality here. It's not, it's not how, it doesn't work. What do you mean by an inverted reality? Well, it, an inverted reality in the sense that um, you succeed by doing bad. You succeed by, by fucking over, excuse my language, you succeed by screwing over uh, your fellow man. If you're stra if that's, that, that, that's if you want to go along with that. I don't care if you succeed. I'd rather not succeed and be okay and take care of people I love. So I'm, whether or not it's success uh, is not, uh, I'm not interested in that. What I'm trying to do is change the frequency here so that that ceases to exist anymore. You're talking about the moon. Uh, the moon the being moon, an amplifier, moons. yes. The moon being an amplifier. And, um, yes. Yeah, so well, it's so interesting that they've announced, um, NASA's announced a contract to go to Mars with Boeing. Yeah. They're using a very similar rocket to the Saturn V. So that seems like a load of hooey for a start. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. Yeah. Um, they Only two solid rocket boosters. I'm being an hour right now, but if you're going to launch the kind of weight that you expect to, to, to lift, to go to Mars, you'd expect rather more than just a big tin can tank and two rocket, solid rocket boosters, because that essentially is all the shuttle had. Yeah, yeah. Then they've got the, the, ju the jump rooms in, um, on Sepulveda Boulevard, which is in um, Los Angeles too, which is right. I lived on Sepulveda Boulevard at the ages of five, six, and seven, and I didn't go to school at that period of time. My parents didn't put me in school, and I spent a lot of time by myself. And um, there are jump rooms at 999 Sepulveda Boulevard, which was maybe two blocks away from where I used to live. And um, yeah, I, the nines are significant. Well, it's just, I mean, as I said, everything is reversal. So, I mean, you, you have 666, but what really is 666? It's not quite what. It's the interdimensional gate. Right. And it's also talking about raw human being. I mean, the, the carbon atoms, six carbon, carbon atoms, six oxygen atoms, six, I think. Oh, right. Didn't right. explain that. It's uh, well, the six 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 is also it's 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 also explaining to you time. You know, sixty seconds in a minute, sixty minutes in an hour, twenty four hours in a day. So you have six 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 there. It's old father time. And what creates time here? Saturn. Saturn is manifesting the false reality of time here. So the big illusion is is is, is time. We have such big people in the past. You know, the land of the giants. The yes. Humans. 
I'm not, I'm not sure that they're gone. I just think the holographic projection is not suited for them to, to, for us to see them, what they really look like. Um, I think they're still here. There's, a, there's, there's an island where they have all the dinosaurs there already. They're still there. You're talking about the movies, though. But no. that's a real place. They right. have, yeah, they have that. Where is that? Well, it's, it's, it's an island off the South Pacific, from what I mean. George Lucas and Steven Spielberg. Steven Spielberg is SS. Um, George Lucas is a CIA insider. And He's saying that the good Jew, like George, not you, George Lucas, is he Jew? George Lucas isn't, no. Oh, sorry, I talked about Spielberg. So. You know, and I'm not saying anything bad about yeah, these yeah. guys. No, I'm, but I'm, all I'm, these things are relative and really... Absolutely. The good-bad thing is, is really academic, and really, if you apply those sort of terms, you're going to miss the point. Absolutely, the absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With, with the dinosaurs on it, well, they're, they're, they, they're still doing experiments and testing them out. They're testing out what, what the abilities are um, and if they can take certain parts of DNA from these dinosaurs and, and place them into human beings, what, attri what extra attributes. Just continuing with the stuff that uh, Barry King's father discovered in World War II. Which was? A lab with strange looking humans being used some kind of transgenetics or some kind of... Right, well, you've got under Dulcie, you've got the seven levels under Dulcie, um, where Nightmare Hall, which is, I think is the sixth level, where they've just put everything you can possibly imagine together, um, you know, testing out things. That's not ever going to happen again. This will never, ever happen again. Why? Tra trapping souls. Because um, universal law now is not, is not allowing it. It's, it's yeah, gone I, too far. I get the impression from other sources that... What's been going on is so illegal. It's so so illegal. It's being stopped. A lot of these, um, a lot of these ones out in Arizona and Nevada now have been just have been stopped, and uh, because you've got people trapped, souls trapped in machines, min, min, where they cannot stop, keep coming back and back again for torturous lifetime after torturous lifetime. There's, and this has been you know over and over again. And, you know, and people, you talk about, well, okay, well, then, you know, you want to leave? How are you going to leave here? Kill yourself? You kill yourself, you're not leaving. You're, you're in even more trouble. So uh, we, we're all now trying to find out how we get out of this prison without walls. What do we do? We look inside and understand what, we have to look inside ourselves and understand what's going on. Because really, really, all of this stuff is just a reflection of what we think about ourselves. So the 9/11 thing is a is a mechanism for controlling that. Was, that. That, that that was a that was a huge um, uh, Stargate ritual, and and between those two buildings, when that happened, it opened an enormous. It was a Crowley, it was a Crowley ritual, and it was connected to the um, the Boleskine House uh, other doorway that he didn't bother to close. But the uh, the, the one in Loftus. Yeah, he didn't close it. He couldn't close it. Or did he not close it? Or did he couldn't close it? He couldn't close it. It was too much for him. He couldn't I mean, held in all these lower, lower fourth dimensional beings that are here now. I didn't want to take part in any of that, so I stood well back. Stood, yeah, stay, I mean, because yeah, these things are. We're talking about the Goetia demons, the high, high Goetia demons that were locked away for a long time. And, and why are they called a hide Goetia demon? Well, you know, in, in the seventy-two Goetia demons are, are ranked sort of similar to our aristocracy here. They have dukes and princes and kings and like that. And um, so they, Crowley wanted to release them here. And the 9-11 ritual released a whole a lot of them like that because they want to create hell on earth. They want to create, well, hell is not the word they'd use, but they want to create, create the lower fourth into 3D here yeah. because they like that. That's what they like. They like that. They, they're slowly introducing, so making it more acceptable that um, p pedophilia is okay, more acceptable that heinous crimes are okay. Yeah, I think this is important that a lot of uh, real bad guys are given the sympathy thing on, yes. on, on TV. And we don't want to push that analogy too far in the present circumstances. Right, yeah, there's a few names I could say, but I'm, I'm, I'm not going to say any names because, you know, we don't want to so do that. So there's a lot of um, basically demonology. What does it really mean? These are other types of dimensional entities. Yeah. 
Nearly got their own worlds to live in. They don't, in. yeah, they don't. They, they're just off this frequency. They're in pockets. Just off, They're in a pocket just off this frequency. And But they were locked down a long time ago because they caused such havoc and mayhem. Uh, the dark sorcerers... Is this is, sorry, is this what you referred to earlier as going to oblivion? That you can recover? The void. The void, you yeah. mean? Yeah, they were locked in the void. In Superman 2, the original one, not the crap remake, uh, you see um, uh, J- Jarrell locked in these three particular demons in this uh, thing like this and they were locked away. Well, that's symbolic of a lot of these Goetia demons being locked down. Now, when you use Goetia magic, you are able, you can, each one represents a different thing, maybe for money, maybe for food, maybe for power. So if you know what you're doing, it's uh, ne- necromancy. If you know how to, necromancy is about the summoning and raising of these particular things. You can yeah, summon them. Jimmy Savile's stuff? Yes. He was actually very, very high up. Well, he obviously must be because of the clearance he obviously got. Yeah, very high clearance. Which is a big alarm bell for the whole, the whole echelons again. You know, of, Absolutely. Of, but you can summon these, and if you do what you're supposed to do, if you do what they say, and you, you know, they'll, they'll do you favours. And, and they, that's at a cost. Oh, yeah, in the end it's at a cost, yeah. You're, you're selling your soul. And they'll that, have you after. Yeah, and that means short-term gain, long-term loss. You can even have what seems like long-term. You can have a lifetime gain. But um, yeah, but uh, but after that, you're always going to lose somebody close to you because they always want somebody. They always want to take something from you that's close to your heart. What happens to those people who are taken? Uh, well, they're you know they're dealing with going to the underworld or whatever you want to call that, lower fourth, until they can get, capture enough energy to re-get into a new body again. They're about staying here. They don't want to go anywhere else or raise vibration. They want to stay here. So they're fighting to get back into a body again and do the same thing again. Which is why we've got all this thing, uh, cyborgs, you know, be able to have machines which last. Yeah. You're well past the human life, lifestyle. Yeah. Like, but there's a way of doing it where you can build, you can rebuild the flesh and blood again as well. You don't even have to have cyber, cyborgs. You can do it, you can do it with, uh, especially with the cold-blooded, like the reptilian cold-blooded. It, it, it's much easier to build, build the building blocks of them than it is um, the mammals. Well, that's interesting that um, one of the things that the Casbolt mentioned was the certain people in charge of certain agencies had, last, had lived a long, long time. Yeah. Yes. Very, you know, like 100 years plus? Yes. Probably more. Way more, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, the, and that's a lot to do with, uh, it's the blood, it's being able to, you can, you can just change your blood again, or you can take somebody else's blood and maintain, maintain youth, keep maintaining youth. But what they're desperately after is the Holy Grail, which is uh, the Holy Grail, um, which is the, what, the Priory of Sion, protected for the longest time. You can get hold of that, you have, that's eternal life. But the Holy Grail is really blood. It's blood from a certain stream. I mean, the, um, the Ark of the Covenant. From That's the a different thing, yes. Gold. Gold holds the souls. Yes. And gold is um, soul energy, yes. Gold is soul energy? Yes. The more gold you have, the more soul energy you've got. Right. That's why they're obsessed with it. It's very interesting. Somebody I, I know recently had a lot of really yellow gold, where you could pure gold. Really? Yeah. Yeah, very powerful stuff. Yeah. Um, okay, you, you haven't really mentioned... Okay, we mentioned... Um, is there anybody else you want, want to mention? Yeah. Um, yeah, um, I, I think it's important that I, that I bring up Anya Briggs because, you know, there's been, there's been a lot that she's said um, over, you know, the last few years. And, um, you know, she, she's a... She, she's she, on the surface. She's a reasonably nice girl. I, I I did I don't know her. I don't really know her at all. Um, the only the only the, my initial connection with her was that um, in 2010, James Casbolt wrote a list. I think it was a list of about uh, 10 people on it. And on the list were pe- he what he wrote were a list of people that um, were involved in MK projects, this project, that project. So, you know, it's kind of like, okay, well... Are any shit. of these lists any credence at all? 
Okay, so I looked at the list and I, first of all, I was like, okay, well, thank you, thank God, finally, I, I can, there's somebody else here that perhaps I can relate to. So this, this, this is a good thing because I felt isolated and alone at the time. So I looked through the list, nothing, nothing, you know, I didn't, didn't contact anyone at first. Then the next day, I had a message from Anya Briggs and it was, she wrote underneath uh, a picture of mine and, and she said, wow, you look so familiar. Um, it's wonderful to be in contact with you. I feel like I've been biblical with you. And uh, actually, what does that mean? Uh, actually, well, actually, at the time, I didn't know what that meant. But, um, you know, after like asking, it, it, it means um, I feel like I've slept with you or I had sex with you. So um, I wrote back to Anya and I, I said, oh, you know, wow, what, I, I don't remember you because I didn't remember her at all. But she, I said, what do you remember about me? And she corresponded with me a lot and she sent me all these things about her remembering me in the Civil War, I think. And she showed me, sent me pictures. What's and, the, the, the American Civil War? Yes. Yeah. There seems to be an awful lot of that going around. She said she, and, and she said, and when she was telling me, I sort of felt, you know, like that, was, that seemed familiar. So we wrote back and forth for a while, and I. Um, this Sorry, was, why would an Englishman be involved with the Civil War? Uh, because um, it has nothing to do with, um, uh, you know, what country you're from, does it? Really, you, you continue on and on. It has nothing to do with that. So um, she, she, uh, we corresponded back and forth, and um, I, I was just very happy to have someone to talk to who, who sort of was in a similar position to me. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a survivor from, from, from these projects, and so is she. You don't tell somebody not to talk to someone. I, I have an opinion. I have a voice that needs to be heard. I would never say don't talk to Anya or anybody else. Everybody needs to be heard. Um, she she um, is is acting, you know, like a woman scorned, and I don't have a problem with her. I don't have a problem with her. I have a problem with her slanderously speaking about me. But in general, she's a she's a human being. She's suffered, and and you know, we're all trying to come together to try and work this stuff out. Finally, it just just this little bit of. Other people or any anybody else? Um, I, 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 I was that you want to talk about? No pressure, just Sarah, don't Sarah, You know, I, I'd spoke to Sarah Steiner a few times. She, a lot of her stories parallel mine. And so again, um, she's English, and she's been in these programs. She mentions James Casbolt and lots sure, of stuff and lots sure. of different things. I sort of remember her, her. Sarah Steiner is a lot more familiar to me. Than and she her. claims that James was was, was one of was actually. Uh, one of the people who was I, I can't get quite get the term, but responsible for, um, oh, I can't really get the term, but James is involved in here. Yeah, yeah, uh, I, and I, I sort of remember Sarah too, and we'd spoken before, and she she said, uh, it feels like I'm sort of like her and I are brother and sister. So I don't, she wasn't one of the people in your original Now, of I, I don't know that for sure, but um, uh, that is possible. I don't know that for sure. I don't remember Anya from any of this stuff. I don't remember, I don't ever remember her, um, so, um, yeah, outside. I mean, of weren't that. I talking adults in their thirties now? What's that? Yeah. I, I mean, this is. You know, yeah, I think Anya's always you know mid forties or something. But yeah. Sarah Stang is. Um, I mean, the basis thing. I've been doing this for over twenty years now. Yeah. Yeah. So it's these programs have been going on a long time. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The oh, so sorry. There are phases of it. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. You know, there was ones, um, one particular one that 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 cornered the uh, the group of children that were born in the fifties. And 60s, and then uh, the mid 70s seems to be when uh, they sort of changed it a little bit. Mannequin came out in 1972, um, and uh, uh, the forerunner to Mannequin was Puppet Master. Yes, Puppet Master. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, you're you're corroborating something that Barry King said 20 years ago. Okay.